we are investigating propagation of an electromagnetic wave inside a parallel plane waveguide. That is if you have two conducting boundaries which are parallel to each other, the way energy will propagate between these two conducting boundaries that is the investigation we are carrying out. Last time we tried to launch a wave which had perpendicular polarization between these two conducting boundaries and as a result we got a propagation which we call transverse electric propagation. Then we also introduced the concept of mode that means the discrete electric and magnetic field patterns which propagate between these two conducting boundaries. Today we can ask a question if instead of perpendicular polarization if we had launched a uniform plane wave between these two conducting boundaries with parallel polarization what kind of propagation will take place would the characteristics be identical to what we had in the previous case that was for perpendicular polarization what are the differences between these two and so on. So, in this case Essentially, we can take a conducting boundary. Below this boundary, we have the conductivity infinite, and above this boundary, the conductivity is 0. So, there is a dielectric medium above this boundary. Again, we take the same coordinate system that the x is oriented upwards, this is the direction z, and y is coming out of the plane of the paper. Let us now launch a uniform plane wave again at an angle theta with respect to the normal to the boundary which is x axis. This will be reflected wave again at the same angle which is theta. But now we are considering the polarization which is the parallel polarization. Now since this is a transverse electromagnetic wave uniform plane wave which is incident on the boundary if the electric field vector lies in the plane of incidence then the magnetic field vector would lie perpendicular to plane of incidence that is perpendicular to plane of the paper. Then without losing generality we can say that let us assume that the magnetic field is oriented coming upwards coming out of the plane of the paper. So, let us say this is given like this. So, this is the magnetic field. And without losing generality I can assume that this magnetic field also is coming upwards. So, this is the magnetic field. So, this is the incident magnetic field, this is the reflected magnetic field. Then using the pointing vector we can find out the direction for the electric field. So, since the wave is coming this way and the h is coming upwards the electric field vector should be this way. So, it will be oriented in this direction. So, this is the electric field which is E i. For this wave since the wave is going in this direction to get a pointing vector this way the electric field should be oriented in this direction. So, this is the direction of the reflected electric field E r. Then the problem is identical to what we had in the previous case. We just find out the components of the electric and magnetic fields and apply the boundary conditions. Now, again taking the two components of the electric field this is tangential component and this is the normal component same here tangential and normal component. If this angle is theta this angle is, is also theta. So, this angle is theta this angle also is theta. So, this component is E i cos theta and this component will be E i sin theta. Similarly, this component here will be E r cos theta and this normal component will be E r sin theta.
Then again applying the boundary condition that the tangential component of the electric field should be 0 at the conducting boundary. That means, if I write down the field expressions as we did in the previous case and if I take x equal to 0 and apply the boundary condition at x equal to 0, the tangential component of electric field should be equal to 0. So, as we have done in the previous case, we can write down again the expression for the incident and the reflected wave for the electric and magnetic fields. So, in this case you have h i will be some amplitude h i with a phase function e to the power minus j beta, where beta is the phase constant in this medium. And this is the wave is coming this way. So, with x axis as we saw last time, this makes an angle of pi minus theta. So, that is x minus x cos theta plus z sin theta. And this field is oriented in y direction. So, we say put a unit vector here y. Same thing I can write down for the magnetic field also for the reflected wave which is h r that is the reflected wave amplitude e to the power minus j beta. Now, this wave makes an angle theta with the x axis. So, direction cosine will be cos of theta. So, this will be x cos theta plus z sin theta in y direction. Same thing I can do for the electric field also and I can write its component and specifically since we are going to apply the boundary condition for the tangential component of the electric field, let us write down this component. So, first the incident electric field E i will be some amplitude E i again e to the power minus j beta minus x cos theta plus z sin theta and E r will be amplitude E r e to the power this quantity will be a vector now because you have to take the component of this electric field in these two direction x and z. So, this will be minus j beta x cos theta plus z sin theta. Then taking the component of the incident electric field in the z direction will be E i cos of theta. So, I can get the z component E E i z that will be E i cos of theta e to the power minus j beta minus x cos theta plus z sin theta. And the component in z direction for this electric field which will be opposite to positive z direction. So, E r z that will be minus E r cos theta e to the power minus j beta x cos theta plus z sin theta. Now, we apply the boundary condition on the electric field that is at x equal to 0 sum of these two electric field should be 0. So, that means at x equal to 0 E tangential which is E i z plus E r z should be equal to 0. So, if I substitute in this expression x equal to 0, 
This is the phase condition e to the power of minus j beta z sin theta which is a common term to both of these. So, from here I will get E i is equal to E r or in other words the reflection coefficient which we have defined which is the ratio of E r and E i that quantity gamma will be E r upon E i that is equal to plus 1. If you recall when we had the perpendicular polarization we had the reflection coefficient minus 1 and we said that time this boundary is behaving like a short circuit because the reflection coefficient is minus 1. So, looking at the transmission line analogy of this particular configuration we concluded that this conducting boundary behaves like a short circuit and that is why the reflection coefficient is minus 1. What is happening in this case? Here we get a reflection coefficient that is equal to plus 1. Does that mean that the boundary is now behaving for this polarization as an open circuit boundary? Because if you go from transmission line analogy, the reflection coefficient for plus 1 means open circuit uh, condition. This is not however true because if you look at the way consider the electric and magnetic fields the direction of electric field for incident and reflected wave are already opposite in direction. So, this reflection coefficient which we are getting minus 1 or plus 1 is essentially means that the direction of the reflected electric field is opposite compared to the incident electric field. So, in the previous case since we had consider the electric field which were coming out of the paper for incident and reflected wave we got reflection coefficient minus 1 that means this field is in opposite direction with respect to the incident field. However, in this case we have already taken a field to satisfy the pointing vector appropriately and they are in opposite direction. So, the negative sign has been absorbed already while defining the direction of the vector electric field and that is the reason the reflection coefficient is appearing as plus 1. So, one should keep in mind that some since we are now dealing with the vector quantities here just looking at the sign of the reflection coefficient would not give you the correct idea of what the boundary is. The boundary is still behaving like a short circuit where the conductivity is infinite here. So, it is like whatever field comes here the voltage is 0 at this location. So, the boundary is still a short circuited boundary. But you get a reflection coefficient plus 1 because the sign appropriate has been absorbed into the direction of the electric field. Once we get that and then using the relation that the magnetic fields are related to the electric field by the impedance of the medium. So, we have E i upon H i is equal to eta which is the intrinsic impedance of the medium. Same thing is true for reflected wave also. So, E r on h r equal to eta. We can now write down the magnetic field and electric field in terms of this quantity E i and E i is equal to E r. So, you can substitute and then find out total electric field and the magnetic fields. So, if I do that I get now the total electric field which is superposition of the incident and the reflected field in medium 1 and same is true for the magnetic field. So, the total fields we are going to get as the electric field which has two components one is in x direction which is combination of these two and one is in z direction which is combination of these two. So, the electric field will have two components x and z and the magnetic field will have only one component that is y which will be oriented this way. So, if I do that and as I did in the previous case I can combine these fields and I can get now the electric field for this medium. So, I can get the x component of the electric field which will be 2 times E i e to the power minus j beta z sin theta. s 
साइन ऑफ थीटा कॉस ऑफ बीटा एक्स कॉस थीटा एंड आई गेट अ जेड कंपोनेंट फॉर द इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड ई जेड दैट इज टू टाइम्स जे ई आई e to the power minus j beta z sin theta cos theta sin of beta x cos theta and the magnetic field which will have only y component hy that will be 2 times ei upon eta cos of beta x cos theta e to the power minus j beta z sin theta and the condition which was satisfied for the perpendicular polarization the same arguments are going to be true in this case also that is if i look at the electric field which is tangential this quantity is going to be zero at x equal to zero that's what we started with this boundary condition that the tangential component should be zero here however the electric field tangential component will also be zero whenever this quantity is multiples of pi so the condition as we had obtained for the perpendicular polarization case we have identical condition in this case also that is this quantity electric field ez will be zero so we have ez zero when beta x cos theta is equal to m pi where m is equal to 0 1 2 and so on and from here we again find out the thetas that is the angle at which the parallel polarized wave can be launched inside the structure and those angles will be m pi divided by beta x so as we discussed in the previous case if i have this x which is the separation between the two conducting plane given to you so this is quantity is d then we can launch the wave at discrete angles which satisfy this condition then and then only the wave propagation will take place inside this parallel plane wave guide so whether we take a polarization which is perpendicular or whether we take a polarization which is parallel the angles at which the wave can be launched inside the structure the same so at the same discrete angle you can launch a parallelly polarized wave you can launch a wave which is perpendicularly polarized wave. so all the argument which we had in the previous case that is you have finite number of angles at which the waves can be launched you have minimum value of frequency which is required all those arguments are now applicable to this field configuration also so saying that the wave guide separation is d is d we have the condition as we had in the previous case cos of theta is equal to m pi divided by beta into d so now the field which you are going to get in this case if i look at these fields now the magnetic field for this case is oriented this way the electric field has a component which is either this or that and the field expressions indicate that these terms are representing the variation of the field in the x direction which is more like a standing wave kind of behavior and this term gives you a behavior which is a traveling wave behavior which is in z direction so in this case also the field should travel in direction z with a phase constant which is beta into sin theta so we have 
a field pattern generated in this case also between the two conducting boundaries which are going to travel with a phase constant beta times sin theta. Now, since the wave is traveling in the z direction and the magnetic field now is perpendicular to this direction of propagation, then it does not have any component along the direction of propagation. The magnetic field is always transverse to the direction of the net wave propagation. So, magnetic field will always remain like that, the wave will propagate. So, the scenario is exactly identical to as we had in the previous case. We have a parallel plane waveguide, the uniform plane wave comes like that, like that, like that, like multiple reflections between the two conducting boundaries, but the magnetic field now is oriented always this way. This is the direction of the magnetic field and the electric field will have two components because it is oriented this way. So, this is the electric field. So, since the magnetic field remains always transverse to the direction of net wave propagation which is this direction which is z, we designate this mode as the transverse magnetic mode. So, we have in this case what is called a transverse magnetic mode and in brief we denote that as the T m mode. Again following the same convention that this quantity m defines the order of the mode and if we saw this essentially gives me how many number of half cycles variation we have between the two conducting boundaries for a particular field that defines the order of the mode. So, if m is equal to 0, the fields are constant. If m is equal to 1, there is one half cycle variation, m is equal to 2, two half cycle variations and so on. So, same arguments are true in this case also. So, we can put an index as we put for T case, we can put an index here which is T m m mode. So, for a given value of d, what value of m we have chosen to excite the fields, this is what will decide the order of the mode of this propagation. So, now what we see we have two types of propagation inside a parallel plane waveguide. One is the transverse electric mode for which the electric field remains transverse to the direction of net wave propagation and we have transverse magnetic mode for which the magnetic field remains transverse to the direction of net wave propagation. Up till now this behavior is very identical. They have the similar conditions satisfied for theta. The field expressions are different, but otherwise principally nothing is changed whether it is a transverse electric mode or transverse magnetic mode. So, this mode also will have the same kind of uh, uh, cutoff condition as we got in the previous case. However, if I look at now the this quantity, this field expressions here and now beta cos theta which we get from here that will be equal to m pi upon d. So, as we had done in the previous case, we have this cos of theta that is equal to m pi divided by beta d and I can substitute for beta which is 2 pi by lambda. So, this is m pi divided by 2 pi by lambda to d. So, that gives me cos of theta is pi will cancel. So, this is m lambda divided by 2 d or beta cos theta is m pi divided by d. You can get do this also m pi by d. So, I can substitute now for beta cos theta in this to get m pi by d into x same here and same here. So, if I substitute explicitly I can get now the fields for this transverse magnetic mode E x that will be 
2 times E i. I am just substituting now for beta cos theta into this into sin of theta cos of m pi x by d e to the power minus j beta z sin theta e z will be 2 times j e i cos theta sin of m pi x by d the same term e to the power minus j beta z sin theta and h y will be 2 times e i on eta cos of m pi x by d to the power minus j beta z sin theta. So, for a given dimension of the waveguide, now these are the field and of course, cos theta we can substitute again from here and once you know cos theta we can get sin theta also. So, the mode which we are now having is T m m mode with suffix small m and that m essentially gives you the order of the mode that gives you number of half cycle variations in the transverse direction that is in the x direction. Now, in case of transverse electric case, we have seen that if I put m equal to 0, then all the fields identically go to 0 and then we concluded that the T 0 mode cannot exist inside a parallel plane waveguide. The same question we can ask in this case also that if I put m equal to 0 in this case, first thing you will note that if I put m equal to 0 in this. So, if we take m equal to 0, then cos theta will be 0. So, theta will be equal to 90 degrees that means the wave now will be going this angle will be 90 degrees. So, wave essentially is going to go grazing to the conducting boundaries. So, from here you get theta equal to pi by 2. So, that means cos theta is 0 and sin theta is 1. So, if I substitute now m equal to 0 in these expressions, this quantity is 1, this quantity again if I put m equal to 0, this quantity is 1, this quantity is 0, but this quantity is not 0, this quantity is again 1. So, in this situation what I find that I have E x that is 2 times E i e to the power minus j beta z because sin theta is 1 and E z is 0 because cos theta is 0. The magnetic field h y will be 2 times E i upon eta. Again this quantity is 1. So, e to the power minus j beta z. And the phase constant which we had in the case which was in the z direction. Now, this phase constant is same as it is in the intrinsic medium which is filling this parallel plane waveguide. That means, the material which is filled between the two conducting boundaries. So, the first thing to note at this point is that in this case when m goes to 0, all the fields identically do not go to 0. That means, T m 0 mode does exist. So, in contrary to T 0 mode, T m 0 mode exists and that is the special mode which we will discuss little later. But conclusion from here is that in this case, the T m 0 mode will exist. 
and then subsequently we will have TM1 mode, TM2 mode and all that. Now the phase constant since we are having this which is same for T and TM mode, essentially we have the relation that beta bar which is the phase constant in Z direction. So this is the quantity which we defined last time, this is the phase constant in Z direction that was equal to beta into sin theta. I can substitute for sin theta, so this is beta square root of 1 minus cos square theta. Taking beta inside, this will be square root of beta square minus beta cos theta whole square, but beta cos theta as we have got this case which is m pi by d, I can substitute here for m pi by d into whole square. So, whether I take a transverse electric case or transverse magnetic case, the phase constant for the net wave propagation which is in z direction is given by this. Now, when I put m equal to 0 in this case, this phase constant becomes equal to beta and for any other value of m which is non 0, then the net phase constant will not be same as beta, it will be always different. Now, once we know this value of the phase constant in the direction of the net wave propagation, then one can ask with what velocity this particular mode will be traveling. So, for a given value of m, what is the velocity with which this modal pattern or the field patterns travel in the z direction. And that we can either define by as we said by group velocity or by phase velocity. If you want to define phase velocity, then we do the same thing, we take this phase combined with time. So, from the first principles, we can find out what is the total phase which is a combination of space and time and then make the phase stationary as a function of time and we get a quantity what is called the phase velocity. In this case, since the wave is traveling in the z direction, that is the phase constant. So, the phase velocity will be omega divided by the phase constant in that direction. So, we get the phase velocity which will be in this case will be in z direction, phase velocity V p that will be omega divided by beta bar because that is the phase constant in z direction. So, this will be equal to omega divided by square root of this quantity. So, I can write here or I can use this expression. So, this is beta square root 1 minus cos theta and cos theta will be m pi upon beta d. So, this will be m pi upon beta d whole square. Now, beta is the phase constant in the medium filling the two conducting planes or that is the medium which is filling this parallel plane wave wide. So, this is the omega upon beta is nothing but the phase velocity of a wave in an unbound medium having same properties as the medium filling this parallel plane wave wide. So, that velocity is as we denoted earlier, this is velocity of, of light or uniform plane wave in an unbound medium. So, we can put omega upon beta that is equal to c. So, we have the phase velocity is c divided by this quantity and here beta I can substitute for 2 pi by lambda. So, I can get 1, 1 minus. So, putting 2 pi by lambda, this will be m lambda 
upon 2 d whole square. For group velocity, either I can use the property that the product of phase and group velocity is equal to c square or I can say that in the parallel plane waveguide, if the wave is going at an angle like that which is theta, the component of this wave in this direction which is the z direction that gives me the group velocity. So, if I really take the velocity in this direction which is c and resolve that in this direction which is the z direction, I get the group velocity of the wave along the parallel plane waveguide. So, since this angle is theta, this angle is pi by 2 minus theta and velocity of this wave in this direction is c. So, I will get c cos of pi by 2 minus theta, so c into sin theta. So, I will get the group velocity which is the component of the velocity in z direction that will be v g equal to c into sin of theta. Again substituting for, for sin theta which is c square root of 1 minus cos square theta. I can get the expression for substituting for cos theta, I can get the expression for the group velocity. So, which is c square root of 1 minus m lambda upon 2 d whole square. We can verify as we discussed earlier the phase velocity is given by this and the group velocity is given by this. So, the product of the phase velocity and the group velocity is equal to c square which we had established earlier. So, as I mentioned I could have found out the group velocity by using that property that the product of v p and v g should be equal to c square or as we have done here we can resolve the velocity vector in the direction of wave propagation and that gives me the velocity of the energy which is the group velocity. So, two things should be noted from these expressions and that is if I look at now this phase velocity expression here. What we note is that if m is not equal to 0 and that is the case which we will discuss later that is a special case, but if m is not equal to 0 the phase velocity is a function of wavelength. So, for a given mode when m is not equal to 0 as the frequency changes the phase velocity of that particular mode changes. Now, this property that the velocity of wave changes as a function of frequency is what is called dispersion. So, what we then find is that when we have a bound medium like this parallel plane waveguide, the structure has become a dispersive structure. That means, when the electromagnetic wave tries to move on the structure, the velocity becomes a function of frequency, a function of wavelength. So, though the medium which we are considering intrinsically, the medium which is filling this waveguide is not dispersive. The conducting boundaries which we talked about, they are ideal conductors, so the energy is not propagating in them. So, neither the boundaries were dispersive, nor the medium which is filling the waveguide is dispersive. But when we put this finite region over which the wave is propagating, this bound medium becomes a dispersive medium. So, first thing important thing to note here is when we have the bound structures, in general we may expect dispersion on the structure. That means, the velocity of wave whatever form the wave travels now on this structure and as you have seen this travels in the form of modes 
their velocity varies as a function of frequency. So, this phenomena is what is called dispersion. And that is a very important thing to note that for a bound structure in general we have dispersion though the media which are involved in creating that bound structure intrinsically may not have any dispersion. Then this relation which we got here that beta which is the effective phase constant is related to this and the size of the waveguide and the mode index. This relation then is called the dispersion relation for a particular mode. So, this expression we call as the dispersion relation. So, dispersion relation essentially tells you the variation of the velocity as a function of frequency or as a function of wavelength. And the conclusion is that whenever we are having a bound structure in general the velocity will vary as a function of frequency. Now, when this quantity for that wavelength when this quantity becomes equal to 1 that we define as the cutoff wavelength. So, when this quantity well beta becomes equal to this this will be 0 and the wave propagation will cease for a frequency lower than that the wave propagation will not take place for the frequency higher than that the wave propagation will take place as we discussed yesterday. We had now the cutoff frequency concept above which the mode propagation takes place. But if I come from the propagating side as I approach to the cutoff frequency that means when these two terms approach each other the phase constant beta bar becomes 0 or in this expression this quantity becomes equal to 1 at the cutoff frequency. The phase velocity of that approaches infinity. So, what we conclude now that as we approach cutoff frequency frequency V p approaches infinity. So, for a particular mode you will have a cutoff frequency and for that cutoff frequency the, the phase velocity will approach infinity. At the same time when the phase velocity is approaching 0 at the cutoff this quantity becomes 0. So, the group velocity approaches 0. So, that means at cutoff the energy flow ceases because there is group velocity is approaching 0. And as I go to frequencies which are very high compared to the cutoff frequencies that means lambda now has become very very small compared to the cutoff this quantity will be negligible. Then the group velocity will approach to C intrinsic velocity in that medium the phase velocity also will approach C because this quantity will be negligible compared to this. So, when we go very far away or higher frequencies compared to the cutoff frequencies then both group and phase velocities would approach to the intrinsic velocity in that medium. So, if I plot the group and phase velocities as a function of frequency I have cut off frequencies for various modes. So, this is the cut off frequency for some mode and this, this is the velocity which is C line. So, if I take a mode T m 1 mode. So, this is the cut off frequency for T m 1 mode. So, let us call it the F C 1 mode. This is for F C second mode is F c third mode and so on. And for m equal to 0 as you have seen when this quantity is 0 there is no cutoff frequency for this. So, this is the cutoff frequency for F c 0 mode which is only true for T m 
because T e 0 does not exist. So, for when m equal to 0, the phase velocity is always equal to c, the group velocity also is always equal to c. So, this is the line which you will always get for T m 0 mode. Whereas, if I go for m equal to 1 and then I have two possibilities, I have T e 1 mode or T m 1 mode both will have the same cutoff frequencies and then at this cutoff frequency the phase velocity will go to infinity, group velocity will go to 0 and as the frequency becomes much larger compared to the cutoff frequency the velocity will tend to C. So, I will get a typical plot which will look something like this and this will start from 0 and will be This is the group velocity which is always below c, the phase velocity is always above c. So, here we have phase velocity and here we have group velocity. This is for this is the case for T e 1 T m 1 mode, these two. If I go to the next mode, then the cutoff frequency at this will be like that, it will start from here, go like that and so on. So, this will be the case for T e 2 and T m 2 mode. So, this one and this one. So, typically if I get the phase and group velocity plot for different modes the plot essentially would look like that. And these are the cutoff frequencies for the different modes. And as you have seen for T m 0 mode, there is no cutoff frequency because when m is equal to 0, the beta bar is always equal to beta which is the phase constant in the intrinsic medium. Now, with this now, then let us go back to our the special case which we are talking about and that is m equal to 0 and if I take m equal to 0, this case, we had got the fields which are now E x and H y, S z was 0 in this case and this special mode is the T m 0 mode. So, let us say specifically I talk about this mode T m 0 mode. Now, since for this mode this is the waveguide, the wave is now launched parallel to the interface because theta is equal to 90 degrees and the electric field is x oriented that means the electric field for this wave is x oriented this is E and the magnetic field is y oriented that is that is this, this is h and the wave is propagating in z direction with phase constant beta. So, the net wave is propagating this way, this is wave with phase constant beta. We will also note from this that if I take a ratio of E x and H y that quantity will be equal to eta. So, for this mode we also have E x upon H y that is equal to eta. So, first thing we note is that this electric and magnetic fields which we have here they are now perpendicular to the direction of propagation which is z. So, E is also transverse to z, H is also transverse to z. So, though this mode we are calling as transverse magnetic mode with 0 index. In fact, this mode is same as the transverse electromagnetic case because here in this case both electric and magnetic fields are transverse to the direction of wave propagation. So, this mode 
we also can call as the transverse electromagnetic mode though this started with tm0 mode but essentially tm0 means electric and magnetic fields both have become transverse so this mode is same as the transverse electromagnetic mode and for this mode the ratio for the electric and magnetic field equals the intrinsic impedance of the medium which is filling the parallel plane waveguide that means essentially we are having a transverse electromagnetic wave which is passing through this conducting planes so it has all the properties which a uniform plane wave had in an unbound medium so its behavior is exactly like a uniform plane wave in an unbound medium one may then wonder when i am having this situation aren't the boundaries affecting the wave propagation what is so special about this case that the boundaries are just not existing for this mode because even if the boundaries were not there the wave would have traveled exactly like this in transverse electromagnetic case it will be uniform plane wave here also we are having exactly like a uniform plane wave and its characteristic like ratio of electric and magnetic field should be intrinsic impedance and so on are exactly identical so aren't boundaries playing any role and if you look very carefully you will see that yes the boundaries are not playing any role and the reason is when the wave is launched now like this the electric field is this way which is perpendicular to the boundaries and there is no boundary condition on normal component of electric field in fact normal component of electric field always can be balanced by the surface charges on the conducting boundary similarly when i have a tangential component of magnetic field i can always have surface currents on the boundaries and i can have the magnetic field so i can have a uniform magnetic field i can have uniform electric field and the wave passes through this parallel plane waveguide as if this boundaries have not modified the electric field because whatever electric and magnetic fields we have they can induce appropriately surface charges and surface currents and these fields do not get modified so essentially this mode propagates in the parallel plane waveguide and since m is equal to 0 this mode is non dispersive that means for this mode the velocity vp is same as group velocity is equal to c the cut off frequency for this mode is zero as you have seen when m is equal to 0 the cut off frequency is zero that means this mode can propagate down to the zero frequency precisely that's what we see when you are having a two conducting system any lowest lowest possible frequency voltage can be applied to this and the energy can be transported however if you go to higher order modes then you require a minimum frequency for transporting the energy so what we find is that in a parallel plane waveguide this tm0 mode which is also transverse electromagnetic mode and that is the mode which essentially propagates at the lowest frequencies but as you go to higher frequencies we require higher order modes or we get higher order modes in the energy propagation 